Oh, first of all, it's an honor to be here um, and see such a vibrant, you know, exciting chapter of people willing to wake up early and come to a, conven a socialist convention on a uh, you know, Saturday morning, which was definitely not the case when I joined uh, DSA around 12 years ago. Uh, I was just finishing high school and it was maybe an organization of 5,000 people. Uh, we had a serious, you know, crisis. We had a really, you know, we had a an old membership. They were really worried that they couldn't get um, new young young people kind of um, involved. Um, we were replenishing our ranks primarily through, uh, or a major part of it was through like direct mailers to the Nation magazine list. Um, and I volunteered at our small national office that summer, uh, you know, uh, the summer of my you know, senior year of high school, and we had just two full time staff. Um, David Dualde, who was a younger, you know, young staffer at the time there, and me uh, unsuccessfully lobbied to get a water cooler in the office, <laughs> but we could not because there was no budget for it. So instead, we had to take our, um, you know, mugs to the bathroom, like down a flight of stairs, and then have lukewarm water that way. But the office was in Wall Street, so it's filled with like I don't know guys in suits running like weird hustles, and <laughs> we would just be running in with our like you know salvador and a mugs <laughs> into the bathroom <laughs> um but um it did have a window at least uh but the window directly faced a brick wall which is probably worse than not having a window um but obviously it's changed since then dsa is a completely transformed organization um you know it's more radical it's more relevant and it's more capable of bringing out change than than at any point before um and i think you know there's a lot of encouraging things going on uh, that I don't need to recite. You know, the Sanders campaign encouraged millions of people to think that things could be different. There was a new wave of mass action, including, of course, the recent um, bunch of teacher strikes. Um, and I think that's revealing to people that they could, in fact, make a difference, that politics can make a difference, and through their actions, they could actually shape the world um, around them. I think we've been trained by neoliberalism, we've been trained by capitalism to just think that uh, everything that's going on in our lives is just our fault and to personalize problems you know you're out of work you should you know take up you know coding or you reformat your CV or something like that um, and I think more and more people are seeing these as social um, social problems and that's that's great for us um, but I'm not going to give a talk about DSA uh, what I want to very quickly discuss is um, what the strategic kind of horizon for any socialist organization uh, should be um, in an era, I guess, when we've gone from just being completely off the map uh, to being something, but obviously in a country of 330 million people, you know, we're still a small movement, we're still a growing movement. Um, so I'm going to begin, or just lay out basically six, seven kind of, um, you know, points uh, that, that are just kind of my perspective on, on where, we're, where we're at, which you could, you know, take or leave. Um, so I guess the first one is class struggle social democracy, so I'll call it, kind of doesn't close avenues for radicals, it opens them. So Sanders, and this also applies to Corbyn, advocate a set of demands that are essentially social democratic um, in nature. So they're, they're advocating uh, changes to improve and reform what's still essentially a capitalist um, system. But they represent something far different than social democracy has come to represent in places like Europe, where a lot of center-left parties are now administering aus austerity and you know, not necessarily even better managers of the system uh, for the working people that are still you know, voting for them out of a lack of alternatives. So for Sanders, obviously, the path for reform is through confrontation for elites. So rather than talk about an entire nation struggling to come together to restore the US economy and shared prosperity, rather than seeking to negotiate a better settlement with business leaders, um, you know, if only they could see the progressive changes in their interests. Um, in fact, business leaders are often smarter than we give them credit for, and that they know that, yes, maybe I'll save some money on my bill if they're single payer healthcare, but then you know, my employers would also have more leverage on the shop floor if I wasn't holding you know, an employer-sponsored you know, plan above their head. Um, so, you know, Sanders' vision in the wider world is often conflated with uh, progressives in the Democratic Party in a broad sense. So, if you read like Politico or publications like that, um, they often talk about the Sanders-Warren, you know, wing of the Democratic Party. 
but there's you know a vast difference between the classical approach of of, um, of Sanders that, that talks about polarization that basically says to people, you know, it's not your fault. Uh, you're working hard and you're not getting enough. And the reason why you're not getting enough is because millionaires and billionaires are taking what's rightfully yours. And the approach of uh, those like Warren that seeks more accountability and seeks more uh, a better um, a better um, settlement. So you know. Sanders isn't perfect, but he wouldn't say something like, you know, strong, healthy, and free markets are, you know, uh, key to a healthy America. Because um, obviously, you know, this is someone who was trained as a socialist in the Young People's Socialist League uh, through trade union civil rights organizing, and I think the world, his worldview is shaped by that background. Um, so, in other words, I think that even though I disagree with some of Sanders' platform, and I think we need to go further than that, I think it represents and what we're going to see in this campaign as it develops in 2019 and 2020 represents a social democratic politics that serves not as a moderate alternative to militant socialist demands, but a radical alternative to decrepit center left um, that's kind of introduced the language of class struggle and class redistribution to millions of people, far more people than we could reach um, as individual uh, socialists with our, with our platforms. And in other words, it's a type of social democracy that's generating working class strength uh, through electoral campaigns, rather than subordinating existing struggles to the goal of getting a few people elected. So it's a huge difference between not even Tony Blair, but even like Ola Palma, like the Swedish prime minister in the 70s and 80s, who was you know, better than Tony Blair. Um, so this kind of class struggle social democracy, I think has the potential to right away uh, win a, um, a major national elections now and you know the type of politics represented by both Bernie and AOC really does have that you know popular uh, resonance so um, you know we consider like where popular sentiment is in the US today um, especially abroad I think people are looking at the US largely through the lens of what Donald Trump is doing and saying and God forbid you know thinking but <laughs> Um, you know, in many ways, our program, our broad set of ideas, is more popular with ordinary people than the right populist kind of Bannon Trump one. So, to give you just one example of this, in a 1994 Pew survey, 63% um, of immigrants were a burden. I uh, hope 60% of uh, uh, my family were immigrants. 63% uh, of um, Americans thought that immigrants uh, were a burden. And only 31% uh, said they were strengthening the country. Uh, when asked the same question today, it's basically flipped. So 27% say that immigrants are a burden. 63% thinks that immigration was a good thing. Um, also, most Americans are calling for an increase in the level of, of immigration, legal immigration, but they also kind of overstate the level um, of undocumented you know, immigration coming to the US. So, you know, that, that part is more ambiguous. But, um, you know, 52% of Americans say they want a jobs guarantee nationwide. It's higher in poorer states that have higher levels of unemployment. So in Mississippi, that number is 72%. Uh, Medicare for all could be just as popular as a you know platform plank in April 2018. Uh, support you know past 50%. So now it's somewhere in the high high 50s, and even the worst of Democrats are claiming some sort of vague, um, you know, allegiance to the, to the idea now. So obviously our challenge is how do you take these individual policy preferences and actually turn it into a set of politics, you know, a kind of more concrete worldview so we're not just single issue campaigning on things, but we're actually building and broadening a level of class consciousness um, and struggle. And obviously, of course, winning election, an election isn't the same thing as winning, you know, power, and there's always a danger of, um, electoralism. So obviously, if you, you know, paid attention to a lot of things that Jacobin's been writing or that, that I've been writing for the last year, a lot of it is about electoral uh, campaigns because I, I do think that they're uh, opening up these avenues for us, but they can't really be ends in themselves. Um, so there's been kind of an overcorrection on the left. You know, when I was a like, student activist, um, it was very much to kind of change the world without taking power you know, uh, days of the, the 90s and 2000s. And a lot of us were correctly identifying the kind of limits of, um, of certain forms of organizing, how it was leading to dead ends, or how uh, kind of bureaucratic and stale these social democratic parties in Europe were, or a lot of the trade union 
um, movement. Um, but you know, obviously now most people are not only coming to the far left, um, but are coming to um, you know socialism through these uh, uh, campaigns. Um, but and uh, and of course, voting is for most people what politics is. So if I you know talk to to someone about you know getting more politically engaged, they'll be like, yeah, I voted in the last you know election, right? So obviously, we can't just afford to to ignore that 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 um, that sphere. Um, but you know the point of the an election. So I keep popping my peas, as they say. I, I, someone told me that yesterday, like when I was I, I was like doing this thing with the microphone. Like you always pop your peas, and I didn't know what that meant, and now I kind of realize. Um, so, um, so you know today, the goal of, of of winning an election has to be to administer a program, right? So you can't just win an election for no other purpose than to just block the right from getting into power. Because if you do that, it might be helpful for a few years, because it'll be really great to get Trump out of office and prevent Trump from administering more harm from people. But if you don't actually carry out any of your demands, you're just going to you know, convince people that politics was actually all a con to begin with. And that level of kind of apolitical disenchantment actually ends up helping the right more than anyone else, or helps you know, pro-business forces because we actually need a mass force to administer our programs, administer our ideas, whereas the right doesn't really need that, right? You could have like 12 European technocrats run the entire economy of Europe, whereas we would need to, if we're gonna administer capitalism, even in the short term, in the interest of, of, of against capital, you're gonna need the mobilization of millions of people. And the, the level of, um, you know, the, the stagger, the difference is, uh, you know, the staggering. So, how exactly do we make elections work for us? I think we have to acknowledge, at the very least, the way in which the kind of class struggle or refor reformism or whatever I was laying out before, class struggle social democracy I was laying out, it's a short-term horizon of a lot of the stuff we'll be doing in the US in the next couple of years, stuff around Sanders, um, is exceedingly differ difficult because candidates face both incentives to compromise and structural pressure due to the fact that uh, administrating the economy requires maintaining business confidence and profits. Um, so business will always choose to kind of withhold investment until more favorable conditions prevail. And voters will quite rationally um, see that there's, you know, that even having bad jobs and economy that's working primarily for the 1% is better than, you know, not having jobs, uh, jobs at all. So, uh, Tony Benn, the, the late Labor Party um, MP, used to put it this way. He described kind of the pressures that he felt being a cabinet member in a Labor Party um, government as kind of do what we want and we'll make you look good. Try to pursue your own agenda and we'll make your life impossible. And, you know, the alternative is kind of an abstract one, but it's creating alternative avenues of strength through three street protests or strike actions to discipline wayward candidates. Uh, for not going along with a redistributive agenda and to force business to make concessions. So in other words, there's penalties that are going to be imposed by business for pursuing a more left-wing, more progressive agenda in the interests of, of the vast majority. We have to impose penalties on the other side and disruptions. Uh, but we're both basically doing the same thing. Capital is threatening to withhold their investment. We're threatening to withhold our labor. That's a primary source of our strength. It comes from the streets, and from there, we'll be able to actually give our elected officials room to um, room, room, uh, maneuver. Um, so that being said, I think a lot of our immediate demands are obviously very achievable. Um, in the broad sense, this dilemma that I laid out of social democracy, I think, is impossible to resolve. You know, it, it's reliant on the continued profitability of private you know, capitalist firms. Um, but there's still space for us to um, to go before we're bumping up against those those um, those limits, um, you know, Medicare for all I think is something we could achieve not just within our lifetimes, in the next you know five years. Um, and that would be the decommodification of like one sixth of the economy. It would it would change people's lives. It would change many of our you know lives in, in here ourselves. Um, and you know other other demands we could easily imagine being accomplished. You know, having guaranteeing access to nutritious food, 
secure housing, free childcare, public education at all at all um, all levels. Um, and you know, our other demands obviously is to center around allowing people to freely organize unions, collectively bargain, and helping to rebuild the political agency necessary to sustain and deepen these um, these um, reforms. But uh, cobbling together the power to achieve these reforms will not be easy, and it's possible to, and even though it's possible to achieve socialist reforms within capitalism, any achievement will be vulnerable to crisis and resisted every step. Um, so it doesn't mean that these day-to-day -day struggles are morally and politically not necessary. It does mean that we need to kind of think beyond this immediate horizon, uh, even if our your goal was just winning these um, these reforms. So. Oh, sorry. I will have to pop my pizza. Um, sorry, it's like my new word of the last 15 minutes. Um, so, any social democrat, no matter their intentions, will find it easier to move to the right than to the left. On one side is the guarantees of stability from powerful interests, you know, so the capital strikes, the other resistance I was talking about, um, and on the other side uh, is, you know, just kind of smooth, uh, smooth sailing. And of course, we wouldn't vote for the other guys because they're even worse. So we need to find a way to both not retreat and to administer our program, but also to press forward because this fundamental ability of capital to withhold investment is a source of their power. So that's why when we talk about the need to create um, worker ownership to decommodify greater sectors of the economy, we're not just talking about pie in the sky utopian things that we believe at a normative level. So obviously we believe that at a normative level because we're saying that, you know, exploitation is wrong and it's a root of capitalist profits, therefore we're against capitalism. Of course that's true, but it's also a necessity because if you create this alternative sector, this socialized sector in our economy, you're also diminishing the ability of capital to even push against these reforms. So in other words, what I'm saying that there's actually a natural connection between the day-to-day -day kind of largely reformist demands that most of GSA engages in and the fact that we call ourselves socialists and we think about um, these deeper levels of socialization. So there's a reason, for example, that we're not the progressive Democrats of America. We, we, we are talking about socialism, talking about independent uh, political, you know, working class um, organizing. Um, so we saw some of this in the 60s and 70s, even in, in social democracy. So the expectation of a lot of uh, Leninists, a lot of people on the far left that weren't even Leninists were uh, that once you got social democracy, you would essentially buy off uh, working people. So people would be militant, they'd be demanding all sorts of changes, um, and you know, uh, a country like Sweden even that we think of is now kind of a very like, kind of sterile, like boring place, uh, there, but, yeah, it was, or at least it, it was under social democracy to some extent, was in fact among the most e unequal and violent countries in Europe with like a really a crazily repressive ruling class. So if you study the Finnish civil war, you would see that like all the, the, the white Finnish kind of counter-revolutionary army, almost all their officers were Swedes because um, they were that committed to, um, to, uh, to fighting you know, socialism in the even 1910s. But as the system developed though, the basic reforms and dignity afforded to people by social democratic reforms actually made them bolder. So people started to ask more radical uh, questions. You know, and it's easy to think about this way. If you're in a situation, let's say 20% unemployment, uh, or versus being in a situation of 2% unemployment, you know, in what scenario would you be more willing to tell your boss to F off? You know, it would obviously be in the scenario where you know, you're in 2% unemployment. In the same way, if you're dependent on your family having health care uh, because you have an employer-sponsored plan, you're obviously going to be less willing to participate in a union draft uh, because you have a lot riding on the line. So these decommodifications, these taking certain sectors out of the, the market, are actually emboldened uh, people. So by the late 70s, you know, the Swedes were starting to talk about industrial democracy. Eventually, by the 70s, they pushed a Meidner plan, which would have slowly socialized you know, production into kind of ownership by these union-run um, you know, funds. These plans weren't perfect, but I think they were a sign that when social democracy develops, often more radical questions can be put on the, the, the table. 
So there's dangers of co-optations, there's dangers of moderation, but the idea that kind of the worse it gets, the better, or that um, kind of pursuing the path of reform doesn't open up more possibilities, I think is, um, is, is wrong. But in the post-war period, we had decades to build these reforms and then get to this point. So Swedish social democracy, for example, uh, started being developed in, in the late 20s, in the 1930s especially, 1938 onward. But and then the post-war period in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you know, the system's slowly developing. And it's all under a social democratic um, rule with, at times, communist support and also support of a powerful trade union federation. And then finally, by the 70s, there's these big decisive battles that's going to see whether we could push from social democracy to something like democratic socialism or whether we're going to retreat. And obviously, we lost that battle. But it took decades. I think this whole cycle is going to play out in much different conditions much quicker. So we might have these 30 years and, and 10 years. Because capital has both shown less of a willingness to accede to demands, and also because the post-war period had really astonishing rates of profit, where a compromise actually made more sense to capital than it would now. And some of these sectors that we'll be organizing in, like service industry sectors and whatnot, you know, the profit rates aren't actually that high. Fuck, I'm saying peas again. Um, but, um, you know, so there's, um, I think, I think there will be stronger resistance, it'll come sooner, it'll be much harder to actually um, push any sort of um, compromise. So I'll just say a few more things. I think one is obviously we, small clusters of ideological socialists can't usher about socialism. And even if we could, you know, we wouldn't really want to do that from, uh, from above. But we still play a really important role in the battles to win reforms and also make those reforms kind of durable and cumulative. So I think part of what we do in, in DSA beyond our really important uh, actions day to day is like training and educating each other and participating in political education where regardless of where we come down on some of the, the details of programmatic things of like what we should be doing and so on and so on, uh, we um, um, at least understand um, the way in which uh, working class organizing often means, you know, um, it, a way in which working class organizing um, uh, means a confrontation and a class with capital, not a not a compromise, and and also the way in which um, you know certain structures are working against us. And I, and I think this is really um, it's really vital to actually have socialists and to have. Um, have our identity kind of be put forward in a way that isn't sectarian or alienating to people, but actually, in fact, um, we are able to tell people like these are this is a national natural progression. You know, I'm for all the things you are, but this is why I, I also think that we need to be more concerned about the power of big corporations and here, how's it, how it connects. And here's why we're not just against the WalMarts of the world, but we but a lot of these dynamics play out at the micro level and even small businesses. And I know you want to support small businesses, but but, and I, we know that they're under a lot of pressure to maintain profitability or whatnot, but here's why, um, you know, we, we need to push against a lot of their interests too. You know, these sort of discussions are discussions that socialists can have, and often uh, I think we can be alienating to people, but that's mostly about our tone, not the fundamental underlying, you know, ideas. Um, and, and I keep saying that we're a working class, and of course, you know, the working class has changed a lot over the 150 years, but, we'll, but it's still the dominant class in society. And what we mean by that is, you know, the people who have to work for other people for a living. You know, that's 60 plus percent of us. Um, and um, it means that day to day, there's billions of people around the world that are shared together in this common uh, precarity. And obviously it's an identity that exists in this kind of objective sense, but also needs to be formed. You know, there needs to be kind of a culture of politics. We need to rebuild worker education societies and a much broader layer of institutions than just organizations like the DSA uh, themselves. Eventually, we'll need kind of political parties to represent this working class um, um, interest. But, you know, saying that we believe in the centrality of kind of the working class isn't to have an image of kind of the mid-century kind of industrial working class, which by the way also exists and still exists by the millions in this country, but it's to say that these new sectors and these um, you know, people are working in warehouses, teachers and, and nurses, all are shared and linked by this common um, this commonality. And obviously it'll take organizing to take these abstract interests and make them more more concrete. But that's you know our task and our 
our, um, our goal. Um, yeah, so I think I'll kind of leave it leave it there. Um, I have um, in like size 16 font here, a conclusion in all caps, but I didn't really give myself more clues than that. So I guess I'll wind up by saying that, you know, DSA has always been a multi-tenancy organization and, and, you know, the ability of people in chapters to pick up and start doing work on a, in the ground is really, you know, important. It's a vital source of our, our strength. Uh, and obviously the challenges we and will end up doing will be kind of balancing, um, you know, setting national priorities, using finite resources um, to like achieve concrete ends, like a kind of, there's a reason why some form of, like it's a very scary word, but some form of like democratic centralism has always been used by left-wing organizations of all types, so kind of freedom of discussion, unity in action, but how do you kind of balance these, um, uh, the need for this kind of, um, organization and direction with the fact that, you know, the diffusion has actually been a key source of DSA strength at this point. I think these are questions I don't have concrete um, answers to, um, but I do think that uh, the key is that we're able to um, kind of stick together and have comradely good faith uh, kind of debates, and we kind of figure out what are our 10, you know, common points of, of interest. What are the things that we can really uh, get behind. And even if we have different tactics about how do we organize the, the working class, can we identify our common enemies? Can we um, like actually go along with things we don't, um, we don't agree with because we'll know that in six months we'll have a shot to persuade and connect with uh, people in good faith debates and you know, win people to our perspective. I think all these things are really uh, tricky. And the real reason why, for a time, you know, I kind of drifted away from, from doing any sort of meetings on the left for like two, three years was um, in from like you know, 2018 to, sorry, 20, 2009 to like 2012 was because uh, for me, like you would spend more time at your meeting deciding when the next meeting was gonna be or talking about points of procedure. And it became like this balance where, you know, so much of it was inward facing. And obviously the goal is to create organizations that have infrastructures to have these debates, that have democratic accountabilities, but that also kind of use our um, limited resources and time to, to reach people. So obviously I don't have any of the answers, but I'm happy to be here. And uh, yeah, thank you for, for having me. Yeah, do, do we want to do any questions? I have questions. Okay, if, if, if everybody, Wants to raise your hand if you have questions, that'd be great. Okay, you know, I see, I'm just getting that. Cool, all right, go ahead. Uh, could you say how you feel, or how you see people with disabilities being important in the democratic Well, I mean, uh, yeah, obviously I think that everyone, DSA needs to uh, incorporate everyone and facilitate, you know, people's, uh, you know, ability to, to participate. So make sure the spaces are accessible and, you know, have kind of uh, working groups and other things to actually, you know, make sure these, these things are, are accounted to. So I think without a doubt, the goal of any democratic socialist organization, the goal of any working class organization is to make sure that everyone's able to participate and then also that you know, the full diversity of, of demands are brought into a common movement and not kind of kept, uh, kept isolated. So, you know, I think it is obviously vital. Hi, Ryan Pollock, uh, thank you for coming down. Uh, I heard a lot of things about class, 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 but I didn't hear the other struggles that intersect with class, such as race and, and Billy and Joey said, ability, uh, gender, such as those things are not, are those not things we should be Focusing on oh, no, I definitely think so. Actually, to be perfectly honest, that was a major part of the last third of what I was going to say. I just was very self-conscious about standing here and talking for more than uh, more than 20 minutes. But, um, but no, I think that the, the bottom line is that we have to think about, we have to tell people and we have to say that, you know, we believe firmly in programs to fight racism, to fight uh, sexism. And in fact, we need a vision of class that um, that is incorporated in these struggles against oppression. So in other words, 
if you want to deal with, uh, let's say, racism in a way that uh, liberals are comfortable with dealing with racism, it often has to do with kind of um, talking about the rhetoric of diversity and all these other things, or uh, you know, when they talk about kind of um, how they're fine with immigrants, they don't actually, they end up proposing guest worker programs that, that hurt, you know, um, immigrant families, but then they say like, oh yeah, but you know, diversity is great because it makes your food taste better and whatever, whatever else. Whereas I think a socialist approach to say is, you know, fundamentally, if we want to deal substantively with something like racism, we have to be talking about the redistribution of wealth and power to marginalized people who don't have it. And if we're talking about the redistribution, of wealth and power, we are talking about, about class. Uh, and I think particularly the way anti-racist organizing needs to be foregrounded in that context is when we um, uh, create kind of dynamics within our own organizations. Um, so for example, you have this common struggle around something like a jobs guarantee. Um, and this is bringing together different kind of um, groups. So once you have, but obviously there needs to be a degree of kind of ideological training um, about you know how we interact together and, and whatever whatever else. But I think the way anti-racism often evoked on kind of the national programmatic level is people would be happier if Bernie like tweeted a few more things, right? They're like it's not like a concrete like uh, here's like this like four demands five demands we want to pursue. So often, um, I think that when there are concrete demands, then there's something for us to to push them on. So for example, for immigrant rights organizing, we could push Bernie on um, adopting abolish ICE as part of his uh, program because that's that's something that's that's laid out there. But often it's being kind of bandied about as kind of a vague, in imperceptible thing where there's no right way for you know, someone to, to, um, to address. So I think we just need to talk concretely about programs, about actions, and also about ways in which we could make our groups more accessible and more um, you know, accountable. in a capitalist marketplace versus their ideology and how, for instance, can you use business structure to um, do those things? Like, for instance, can you speak to the ownership structure of Jacobin and any tensions that exist? Yeah, so, I mean, Jacobin is a, is a non-profit. Non so, um, it just means that I'm you know, an employee of a non-profit board and we have a egalitarian kind of like wage structure, like equal pay for equal work, wage transparency, and all those other things, which I think are really, um, are really important. But obviously, yeah, there's a finite amount of resources, and um, a lot of the structures that we collectively put in place, you know, um, at, at Jacobin, so like everyone's involved with, um, involves like rationing finite resources to achieve a political, a political end. Um, so um, in that case, I think you know it's it's a useful you know a useful thing. But for us, we're subscription driven. So when we our goal is to reach readers with essentially socialist propaganda, and we sustain ourselves largely by getting more readers for our socialist propaganda. So the two things are in sync. I think where there are tensions is when the left becomes dependent on foundations and becomes dependent on you know whatever whatever else it is. There's a whole kind of industry of the left, um, you know, liberal left foundations now giving more money to left-wing causes, but then they want you to professionalize in a certain way, so you need like grant writers, so you end up like trying to beg rich liberals to give you a hundred grand and you're spending like 60 grand to do that, which like, you know, I think is a, is a problem. But fundamentally, we need um, also DSA to develop its own 
publications its own way to have certain internal uh, debates and to, to flesh out things. And I like to think that Jacobin's role is more to keep the flame alive for socialist ideas and to think more about 10, 20, 30 years. And also, like, uh, out of our audience, around 52% is in the US, the rest are, are abroad. And out of that 52%, about half of them, I mean, this is just surveys, half of them um, are DSA members, and only half of those people are like, active in, in chapters. So I think it would be for everyone's benefit if DSA had like a really robust, like democratic left, um, you know, publication. And I know it's been improved, but if it continues to improve, it also has a web presence. Um, and we could just like write obscure articles about the, um, you know, Hungarian Revolution or something, you know, like um, because I think the most important um, thing for a publication to do is often think in terms of kind of epochs and continents and not get bogged down in the latest you know thing that happened on the internet you know last uh, last week and the other end of it is that Jacobin represents the views and orientation of like a pretty eclectic and diverse group of people but like a couple dozen you know people um, and it's not meant to be kind of a broad mass democratic organization, even though we obviously take our responsibility to publish varying views on things, uh, you know, seriously. So that's all the more reason why DSA needs its own um, organs and for them to be bigger.